Welcome to Dang Dang Ka Channel. Categories Celebrity Biography. Fidel Castro Biography by Biography.com. Synopsis. Cuban dictator Fidel Castro was born near Brent. Cuba, in 1926. Beginning in 1958 Castro and his forces began a campaign of guerrilla warfare to successfully overthrow Cuban dictator Fulgencio Batista, and Castro became the country's new leader. His communist domestic policies and military and economic relations with the Soviet Union led to strained relations with the United States that culminated in the 1962 Cuban Missile Crisis. He was also responsible for fomenting communist revolutions in other countries around the world. Under Castro, improvements were made to health care and education, while civil liberties were severely eroded. However, the 1991 collapse of communism and its negative impact on Cuba's economy led Castro to relax some restrictions over time. Amidst failing health, in 2008 Fidel Castro officially handed over power to his brother Raul Castro, though he still wields some political influence in Cuba and abroad. Early life Fidel Alejandro Castro Ruiz was born on August 13, 1926, near Brent in Cuba's Eastern Oriente province. He was the third of six children, including his two brothers, Raul and Ramon, and three sisters, Angela, Emma, and Agustina. His father, Angel, was a wealthy sugar plantation owner originally from Spain, who did most of his business with the American-owned United Fruit Company, which dominated the agriculture in that region at the time. His mother, Lina Ruiz Gonzalez, had been a maid to Angel's first wife. Maria Luisa Argeta, at the time of Fidel's birth. By the time Fidel was 15, his father dissolved his first marriage and wed Fidel's mother. At age 17, Fidel was formally recognized by his father and his name was changed from Ruiz to Castro. Educated in private Jesuit boarding schools, Castro grew up in wealthy circumstances amid the poverty of Cuba but was also imbued with a sense of Spanish pride from his teachers. From an early age, Castro showed he was intellectually gifted, but he was also something of a troublemaker and was often more interested in sports than studies. He attended Colegia Dolores in Santiago de Cuba and then El Colegio de Belén in Havana, where he pitched for the school's baseball team as well as playing basketball and running track. After his graduation in late 1945, however, Castro entered law school at the University of Havana and became immersed in the climate of Cuban nationalism anti-imperialism and socialism, focusing his energies more exclusively on politics. Early political insurrections and arrests By 1947, Castro had become increasingly passionate about social justice and he traveled to the Dominican Republic to join an expedition attempting the overthrow of the country's dictator, Rafael Trujillo. Though the coup failed before it got started, the incident did little to dampen Castro's passion for reform, and he traveled to Bogota, Colombia the following year to participate in the anti-government rioting there. In 1947, Castro also joined the Partido Ortodoxo, an anti-communist political party founded to reform government in Cuba. Its founder, Cuban presidential candidate Eduardo Chávez, lost the 1948 election but inspired Castro to be an ardent disciple and considered another run for president in 1951. He pledged to expose the government's corruption and warn the people about General Fulgencio Batista, himself a former president, who was plotting a return to power. However, Chávez's efforts were cut short after his supposed allies refused to provide evidence of government wrongdoing. In August 1951, Chibas shot himself during a radio broadcast after failing to keep his promise. Meanwhile, Castro had married Myrta Diaz Ballard, who was from a wealthy political family in Cuba. They had one child, named Fidel, in 1949. The marriage exposed Castro to a wealthier lifestyle and political connections. At the same time, however, he developed an interest in the work of Karl Marx and became intent on running for a seat in the Cuban Congress. But in March 1952 a coup led by General Fulgencio Batista successfully overthrew the government and the upcoming election was cancelled, leaving Castro without a legitimate political platform and little income with which to support his family. Batista set himself up as dictator solidified his power with the military and Cuba's economic elite and got his government recognized by the United States. In response, 
Castro and fellow members of the Partido Ortodoxo organized a group they called the Movement and planned an insurrection. On July 26, 1953, Castro and approximately 150 supporters attacked the Moncada military barracks outside of Santiago de Cuba in an attempt to overthrow Batista. However, the attack failed and Castro was captured, tried, convicted and sentenced to 15 years in prison. His brother Raul was also among those imprisoned. Guerrilla War Against Batista While incarcerated, Castro renamed his group the 26th of July Movement and continued to coordinate its activities through correspondence. He and his compatriots were ultimately released in 1955 under an amnesty deal with the Batista government, and he traveled with Raul to Mexico, where they continued to plan their revolution. In Mexico, Castro met with other Cuban exiles, as well as the Argentinian Ernesto Che Guevara, who believed that the plight of Latin America's poor could be rectified only through violent revolution. He joined Castro's group and became an important confidant, helping to shape Castro's political beliefs. On December 2, 1956, Fidel Castro returned to Cuba aboard the boat Granma with little more than 80 insurgents and a cache of weapons near the eastern city of Manzanillo. In short order, Batista's forces killed or captured most of the attackers, but Castro, Raul, Guevara and a handful of others were able to escape into the Sierra Maestra mountain range along the island's southeastern coast. Over the course of the next two years, Castro's steadily growing forces waged a guerrilla war against the Batista government, organizing resistance groups in cities and small towns across Cuba. Castro was also able to organize a parallel government, carry out some agrarian reform and control provinces with agricultural and manufacturing production. Beginning in 1958, Castro and his forces mounted a series of successful military campaigns to capture and hold key areas throughout Cuba. Combined with a loss of popular support and massive desertions in its military, Castro's efforts finally led to the collapse of Batista's government, and in January 1959, Batista himself fled to the Dominican Republic. At the age of 32, Castro had successfully concluded his guerrilla campaign to take control of Cuba. A provisional government was quickly created, with Manuel Arusha installed as president and José Miro Cardona as prime minister. It quickly gained the recognition of the United States, and Castro himself arrived in Havana to cheering crowds and assumed the post of commander-in-chief of the military. In February 1959, Miro suddenly resigned and Castro was sworn in as Cuba's prime minister. Meanwhile, hundreds of members of Batista's government were tried and executed. Turned to communism, Castro implemented far-reaching reforms by nationalizing factories and plantations in an attempt to end U.S. economic dominance on the island. Among these reforms, it was announced that the new government would base compensation to foreign companies on the artificially low property values that the companies themselves had negotiated with past Cuban governments in order to keep their taxes low. American companies soon felt the negative effects of such measures, leading to a significant strain in relations between the Cuba and the United States. During this time, Castro repeatedly denied being a communist, but to many Americans, his policies closely resembled a Soviet-style control of both the economy and government. In April 1959, Castro and a delegation visited the United States as guests of the National Press Club. Castro hired a renowned public relations firm to help promote his tour, but President Dwight Eisenhower refused a meeting with him. That May, Castro signed the first Agrarian Reform Act which limited the size of land holdings and forbade foreign property ownership. On the surface, the intent was to develop a class of independent farmers. In reality, this program led to state land control, with the farmers becoming mere government employees. By the end of 1959, Castro's revolution had become radicalized, with purges of military and government leaders, including President Arusha and the suppression of any media critical of Castro's policies. Castro's government also began to establish relations with the Soviet Union. The USSR sent more than 100 Spanish-speaking advisors to help organize Cuba's defense committee. In February 1960, Cuba signed a trade agreement to buy oil from the Soviet Union and established diplomatic relations. When U.S.-owned refineries in Cuba refused to process the oil, Castro expropriated them. 
and the United States retaliated by cutting Cuba's import quota on sugar, thus beginning what would become a decades-long contentious relationship between the two countries, Bay of Pigs and the Cuban Missile Crisis. The year 1961 proved to be pivotal in Castro's relationship with the United States. On January 3, 1961, Outgoing President Dwight Eisenhower broke off diplomatic relations with the Cuban government. On April 14, Castro formally declared Cuba a socialist state. There days later, some 1,400 Cuban exiles invaded Cuba at the remote Bay of Pigs in an attempt to overthrow the Castro regime. The incursion ended in disaster, with hundreds of the insurgents killed and more than 1,000 captured. Though the United States denied any involvement, it was revealed that the Cuban exiles had been trained by the Central Intelligence Agency and armed with American weapons. Decades later, the National Security Archive revealed that the United States had begun planning an overthrow of the Castro government as early as March 1959. The invasion was conceived during the Eisenhower administration and inherited by President John F. Kennedy who reluctantly approved its action but denied the invaders air support in the hopes of concealing the U.S. role in the effort. Castro, in turn, was able to capitalize on the incident to consolidate his power and further promote his agenda. On May 1 he announced an end to democratic elections in Cuba and denounced American imperialism. Then at year's end, Castro declared himself a Marxist-Leninist and announced the Cuban government was adopting communist economic and political policies. On February 7, 1962, the United States imposed a full economic embargo on Cuba, a policy that continues to this day. In the wake of the Bay of Pigs incident, Castro intensified his relations with the Soviet Union by accepting further economic and military aid. In October 1962, his increasing reliance on Soviet support brought the world to the brink of nuclear war. Hoping to deter another U.S. invasion of Cuba, Castro and Soviet Premier Nikita Khrushchev conceived the idea of placing nuclear missiles in Cuba, just 90 miles off the coast of Florida. Khrushchev justified the move as a response to U.S. Jupiter missiles that had been deployed in Turkey. However, an American Nu-2 reconnaissance plane discovered the base construction before the missiles were installed and President Kennedy responded by demanding the removal of the missiles, with orders for the U.S. Navy to search any vessels headed for the island. Over 13 anxious days of secret communications between Khrushchev, Kennedy and their agents, the Soviets agreed to remove the missiles in exchange for the United States' public agreement not to invade Cuba. The Kennedy administration also agreed to secretly remove the Jupiter missiles from Turkey. Both leaders saved face and gained some admiration for restraint. Castro, on the other hand, was humiliated. Both superpowers had completely left him out of the negotiations. Furthermore, the United States was able to persuade the Organization of American States to end diplomatic relations with Cuba, in response to Castro's shameful actions. Cuba under Castro. But Castro wasn't shamed for long. In 1965, he merged Cuba's Communist Party with his revolutionary organizations, installing himself as head of the party. Within a few years, he began a campaign of supporting armed struggle against imperialism in Latin American and African countries. In January 1966, Castro founded the Organization for Solidarity with the Peoples of Asia, Africa, and Latin America to promote revolution and communism on three continents. In 1967, he also formed the Latin American Solidarity Organization to foster revolution in select Latin American countries. In the 1970s, Castro continued to promote himself as the leading spokesperson for third world countries by providing military support to pro-Soviet forces in Angola, Ethiopia, and Yemen. Though Cuba was still heavily subsidized by the Soviet government during this period, those expeditions ultimately proved unsuccessful and put a strain on the Cuban economy. Meanwhile, the U.S. agreement not to invade Cuba had not precluded attempting to topple the Castro regime in other ways. Over the years, Castro was the target of numerous CIA assassination attempts, an estimated 638 in all. According to Cuban intelligence, ranging from exploding cigars to a fungus-infected scuba diving suit to a mafia-style shooting. Castro took great delight in the fact that none of the attempts ever succeeded and was quoted as saying that if avoiding assassination attempts was an Olympic sport, 
he would have won gold medals. Castro's regime has been credited with opening 10,000 new schools and increasing literacy to 98 percent. Cubans enjoy a universal health care system, which has decreased infant mortality to 11 deaths in 1,000, 1 1.1 percent. But at the same time, civil liberties were whittled away. As labor unions lost the right to strike, independent newspapers were shut down and religious institutions were harassed. Castro removed opposition to his rule though executions and imprisonments, as well as through forced emigration. During Castro's rule, hundreds of thousands of Cubans fled the country, many settling just across the Florida Straits in Miami. The largest of these exoduses occurred in 1980 when Castro opened up the port of Mariel to allow exiled Cubans living in Miami to come claim their relatives. Upon their arrival, Castro also loaded the ships with Cuban prison inmates, mental patients and other social undesirables. In all, nearly 120,000 Cubans left their homeland in 1980 to find sanctuary in the United States. Collapse of the Soviet Union After the 1991 collapse of the Soviet Union sent Cuba's economy into a tailspin. Castro's revolution began to lose momentum. Without cheap oil imports and a meager Soviet market for Cuban sugar and other goods, Cuban unemployment and inflation grew. The contraction of the Cuban economy resulted in 85% of its markets disappearing. Yet Castro was very adept at keeping control of the government during dire economic times. He pressed the United States to lift the economic embargo but it refused. Castro then adopted a quasi-free market economy and encouraged international investment. He also legalized the U.S. dollar and encouraged limited tourism, and in 1996 he visited the United States to invite Cuban exiles living in there to return to Cuba to start businesses. In 2001, after massive damage was caused by Hurricane Michelle, Castro declined U.S. humanitarian aid but proposed a one-time cash purchase of food from the United States. George W. Bush's administration assented and authorized the shipment. With the fuel supply running dangerously low, Castro ordered 118 factories to be closed and sent thousands of Cuban doctors to Venezuela in exchange for oil imports. Shifting power In the late 1990s, speculation began to arise over Castro's Asian well-being. Numerous health problems have been reported over the years, the most significant occurring in 2006, when Castro underwent surgery for gastrointestinal bleeding. In a dramatic announcement, on July 31, 2006, Castro designated his brother Raul as the country's temporary leader. Raul had served as Castro's second-in-command for decades and had been officially selected as his successor in 1997. Following Fidel Castro's surgery, his only appearances were in photographs and video recordings of meetings. On February 19, 2008, 81-year-old Fidel Castro permanently gave up the Cuban presidency due to his deteriorating physical condition. He handed over power to Raul who was 76 years old at the time. The Cuban National Assembly officially elected Raul Castro as president of Cuba the same month, although Fidel Castro reportedly remained first secretary of the Communist Party. In April 2011, news broke that Fidel Castro officially stepped down from his role within Cuba's Communist Party. Raul Castro easily won election as the party's new first secretary taking over for his brother and choosing famed revolutionary Jose Ramon Machado Ventura to serve as the party's second in command. Fidel Castro claimed that he had actually resigned the post five years earlier. In his retirement, Castro has taken to writing a column about his experiences and opinions, called Reflections of Fidel, and in 2007 his autobiography My Life was published. From mid-November to early January of 2012, however, Castro failed to publish any columns. This sudden silence sparked rumors that Castro had taken a turn for the worse. But these stories soon proved to be unfounded, as Castro put out a flurry of articles later that January. Though not involved in the day-to-day -day affairs of running Cube, Fidel Castro has still maintained a certain degree of political influence both at home and abroad. In recent years he has continued to meet with foreign leaders, such as Iran's Mahmoud Ahmadinejad in 2012, during their visits to Cuba. Pope Benedict arranged a special audience with Castro at the end of his trip in March 2012.
seeking to obtain greater religious freedom for Catholics living in the communist nation, and in September 2015 Pope Francis met privately with Castro as well. However, when Barack Obama became the first sitting American president to visit Cuba in almost 90 years, he did not meet with Fidel Castro, who later denounced the goodwill mission in his column, citing a mistrust of U.S. motivations in writing. We don't need the empire to gift us anything. 